stars, you know them by name. The grains of sand on every beach in the world, Lord. Yet, even we sometimes, we question what's going on. We question the things that are going on in our life. And, like, why is this happening? This, this, like, this must have missed something. But, Lord, we thank you for the reminder that you, you saved us. It wasn't the other way around. You saved us. You know exactly what we need, what we needed. Lord, you are shaping us through every season that we go through, no matter what it looks like. Remember that you, with the stars in the place, you have aligned everything according to your will, Lord. And so, Lord, we submit to that will, to your will, to your plan. We give everything to you. Lord, we just give you our hearts and our minds today. Uh, we pray that we hear something, Lord. Um, we are ready to listen and hear what we need to hear. To be convicted, Lord, to be encouraged, whatever it looks like. We pray that we are listening today to you through the word. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Morning, everybody. Welcome to Lake Water Creedian Church. Um, my name is John Avery, I'm the lead pastor here. If you are new, I want to say thank you for joining us. Um, on your way out, if you haven't yet, there are some cups in the welcome desk. Inside the cup is some information about our church. There's also a connect card inside that cup. Um, if you are new, you actually fill that connect card out. You can drop it. You can walk to the back on your way out. Um, this allows us to connect with you this week. If you have any questions or any prayer requests, um, if you are a regular tender member, they always say if you pay for tithes and offerings, you can give me an offering box in the back and give all of the one church. Dot I me. Um the kids are supposed to be there and they left, so it's good. <laughs> there it is. All right. Um a couple quick announcements. We don't have a whole lot, I probably your bulletins, we're gonna have in front of you, but it, 
there's not a whole lot in there. Um, we're kind of like in a, in a in between season right now between having a lot of stuff going on and, um, and, and nothing really. Um, we were gonna do a sunny party today, so we had to Notice there's really any snow outside. So we're not gonna have a sunny party after the service today, which is kind of a bummer. So, um, and we're probably not gonna reschedule. Maybe if we get a whole bunch of snow, maybe we'll just throw one out, we'll do one. Um, but for right now, we either pray for snow or just pray for spring. Good choice. Uh, right. So um, we do have, one thing is coming up, and we do have our Easter event coming up. Um, it is gonna be, I don't know the front of me, but it's March 23rd, Saturday. It's a, it's a Saturday. It's a weekend before Easter. And so um, we don't have all the details planned out yet, but we know it's March 23rd. We're trying to figure out a venue. Because it's earlier in March, we're probably going to be inside. So that's why it's kind of taking a little bit longer to figure this out. It's trying to find an inside venue. Um, but uh, we are going to be volunteers for that. Something to be praying about. If you can volunteer, um, we usually do a, a, a walk through a, a Journey to Hope, where it gives uh, some of you seen this, you haven't seen it, it's a great thing. The kids have games and stuff, and, and uh, but it all tells a story from Genesis all the way to uh, Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection. So it's an amazing little thing for kids to do. Uh, we're also the fun, well, that's fun too, but also the bounce houses, uh, cotton candy, well, I don't know. It's just, it's a blog party with that. Anyways, I'm just rambling at this point. But we do need candy for that as well. So if you want to start uh, bringing candy, that'd be great um, for that. And one other thing, our Rooted, which is a once a month Bible study, that is going to be happening on uh, March 14th. Um, so you can mark your calendar for that. We are trying to figure out exactly the topic's going to be for that. But uh, if you, it's a once a month Bible study. We do it every single month. And so I would encourage you to come to that if you have time available. So let's pray one more time. I'm going to dive into God's Word this morning. Father God, thank you for... Um, this church body, Lord, thank you for um, all that you are doing in this place, Lord. Thank you for the people that have uh, come today, Lord, to worship you and to, to sit underneath the, the, uh, your words being, being preached and taught, Lord. I just pray that you would um, be with that church body, God, as, as there's just many things happening, Lord, with, with many people that I know are, are sick, family that are sick, that uh, just dealing with um, illness and, and illness has been lasting for months, Lord. I pray for all those people, Lord, that aren't here right now because uh, they are sick. And Lord, the, those that are dealing with more uh, serious things, like uh, I know people are dealing with um, recovering from surgery or just body aches or uh, even to in our congregation with cancer, God. And, and definitely, uh, keep, we, we thank you, Lord, for what you've done uh, in the Miller's life with the Sheila, Lord. And just thank you that uh, the miracle you did in her life truly is, Lord, the miracle that she is um, she made it through, and Lord, we thank you for that, that, uh, uh, the blessing, and, and even be able to see just your work unfold before our eyes, God. I think sometimes we just try to make it seem like it's, it's, it's nothing, but Lord, you, you did amazing work, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for that, God. And also just, uh, pray for her recovery, and, uh, and just thank you, Lord, uh, for, all you're doing in their life, Lord. Thank you for the baby that is now uh, in their family, God. That's, children are always a blessing. I never, never want to forget that, God. Um, Lord, I pray for us, uh, for our outreach, Lord, as a congregation, and just, as we always pray for our our area, for Oakland and Waterville, Lord, for them, for for us to be a witness, for us to be a light, a city on the hill, God, that cannot be hidden. I pray our light shines bright and that, that uh, we would see revival, God, in our community. And that you would use this church um, and all other churches in the area that are, that are preaching the gospel, God, that you would do an amazing work through um, the, the the churches, through, through the, the Spirit, just going out before us, Lord, and, and convicting people's hearts. And, and, and really, it's, it's you that does the work, God. We're just we're just your servants, God, following you. Lord, I pray you show us the, where we need to go, what we need to do, and give us wisdom, and especially the elders and leaders that are, are always talking about what what you have for us, Lord. I pray you would guide this church uh, to just further the kingdom, God, in this area, Lord, and, and then uh, just even, you know, even further, Lord. I pray that we would uh, just see the world impacted, God, um, by uh, not just our church, but all churches, Lord. We, see, we pray for for just your kingdom come, Lord, to this earth, uh, Lord. And I, I just pray, God, for us as we dive into your word this morning, as we um, uh, dive into the book of Genesis and dive further into the, the fall of Genesis 3, uh, I pray you would uh, 
you do the work in, in our hearts this morning, oh God, that, that the Holy Spirit is in this place and the Holy Spirit does the work that I cannot do and that I would speak to our hearts, God. I pray you would uh, show us what we need to see, convict us, encourage us, challenge us this morning, Lord. I pray you do an amazing work in our lives and we leave here changed um, by your word. Amen. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so we are on in Genesis chapter 3. If you buy us, go ahead and open up there. Um, we are plugging away through this book. It has uh, taken us a while. It's going to take us a while to get through this book. Um, and I, I really love the book of Genesis. And so it's, what's amazing is I have read Genesis, I don't even know how many times, especially the first few chapters. I have read the first few chapters. I've preached on these three chapters multiple times. And what I find so amazing is, I mean, Scripture tells us that, that the Word of God is alive and active and and. And it's evident every time I go through this book. And I go through, uh, just especially, like I said, especially Genesis 3. Like, I, even, even this week as I'm studying through it, like, I've read this. I can't even probably count them on one. I've, I've read this, these three cha- this chapter so many times. And even this week as I'm studying through it, I'm like, I've never noticed that before. I've never seen that before. I've never, and God is showing me the more things that, that, that not only just fills my mind more, more knowledge, but it also impacts my everyday life. And it leads me to live differently, to think differently. So, um, this book's amazing. I love Genesis, and I'm really excited to go through this. Um, so, anyway, so today we're going to be back in Genesis chapter three. So, if you have your Bibles, if you are new with us, we don't put these passages on this, the main passage on the screen. So, uh, grab a Bible in front of you. Uh, Genesis chapter three. Now, this uh, chapter we're taking, uh, we're going pretty slow through it because there's so many foundations, which is the name of our series, that are set up inside of this chapter. And these foundations, they, they set up the, really the rest of the Bible for us. Many of the things that we understand about Scripture, understand about the Bible, understand about Jesus, and understand about God, it, it, it is, is laid out in Genesis 3. But also, I think even, even it's also important to notice that, especially when we start getting through the, the judgments and the curses of God in, in Genesis 3, how it impacts our everyday life. In Genesis 3, it, it, it tells us and explains why there's suffering, why there's evil. It explains the gospel and why Jesus had to come and the importance of him coming and, and why he had why there was why there had to be death, why Jesus had to raise the dead. Everything if we don't understand this chapter of Genesis 3, you really have a hard time understanding the rest of scripture. It, it, it's it, nothing's gonna it, it's not it's you might understand the gospel, but you don't understand the depth of the gospel until you understand Genesis 3, if that makes sense. So um now, most of us understand what happens inside of this chapter. Um, even if you, um, is this your first time in church? If you're not a Christian, if you've never even stepped foot in church before, you probably have heard the story of Adam and Eve. Um, most people have, have heard this story. They might not know all these little details, but they know that there were these two people, husband and wife, they ate of the tree they weren't supposed to, and because they ate of that fruit, uh, they sinned, they disobeyed God, and, they, and because of that, the world is the way that it is, right? Most people understand that basic story of, of Adam and Eve. And as we already established and, and, and studied already, we, we understand the effects of, of sin. It is seen in our life. We know the effects of sin. We, we've all felt the guilt of, of when we deliberately decide to disobey God. Most of us, all of us, I'd even say, has felt the shame before. Shame that, that, that Adam and Eve felt right after they sinned, right after they disobeyed God. The shame that's really, as you look throughout Genesis 3, you keep finding this, this word that they're, they're naked, right? And, and they're uh, basically ashamed. And it's, all of that is, is meant to us to understand that Sin makes us feel like we are unworthy, right? It makes us feel like we can't be loved or accepted anymore and that we are too far gone because we have disobeyed God. We can't be forgiven and we can't be loved. But we saw last week, something amazing that happened before we get to, as we get into this week, the judgment of God. Before we get to that, one thing we see is so amazing is the mercy of God. That God is a God of mercy. That he had every right to punish Adam and Eve right after they sinned, right after they disobeyed God. God had every right to end their life. To just end it right there, start new, maybe make a new Adam and Eve, maybe call them something different. right? He had every right to just kill them right on the spot, but he didn't do that. That is God's mercy on full display. I'm not giving giving them what they rightfully deserve. Before we move on and study today's text, it's one thing we need to understand also about God's character. God is merciful, right? We understand about God. God is loving. But as much as God's merciful and loving and also gracious, 
God is also just. Meaning that God is perfect in his justice. He never makes a wrong decision. He does it. When he says something, he means it. He doesn't go back on his word. His punishment and his consequences are perfect and right and never wrong. So why this is important is that because for God to be just, which is part of his character, there must be judgment for sin. Adam and Eve must face the consequences for their sin. They disobeyed God. If God did not give them the consequences, God would not be just. Their actions were evil and wrong. They disobeyed God, and there must be penalty for their sin. I remember when I was younger, I, I never, and this is, this is why I think it's so important to understand that God is, is just, and God is a God of, 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 yes, love and mercy and grace, but he's also a God that does uh, cast judgment on us. When I was younger, I never quite understood, even growing up in church, and understood why there had to be judgment. I remember was thinking for, for years, and even into my early, early adulthood, I never quite understood why Jesus had to die. And maybe, maybe you never thought of this before, but for me, this is the one thing that really kind of stood out to me. Why did Jesus have to die? Why, why did Jesus have to come to earth and die this gruesome, awful death on, on the cross? Like, why couldn't God just forgive sin? Right? He's God, right? Could, couldn't he just say, you forgive it, done. Could, couldn't he just said to Adam and Eve, all right, yeah, I know you did this, but, and, and I know some of the good parents in life, <laughs> like, you, you, you say, I'm going to punish you, but I'm going to take away that punishment, right? Could, couldn't God just do that? Couldn't God just say, okay, well, yeah, I said I would kill you, or you're going to die, but I changed my mind. Couldn't God just do that? I mean, it's God, after all. He made, he made up the consequences. Couldn't he just take them away? And maybe some of you have never thought of that before. Maybe some of you have. But listen to me. This is very important to understand. It would be impossible for God to forgive sin without there being a payment or judgment for that consequence. And I said impossible. Because it's impossible because it, God is just. And for God to go against his own character is impossible for him. Because if he just forgave sin without payment, without, their, without any debt being paid, God would not be just anymore. His justice would not be perfect. If our, if our judicial system just started forgiving people for the crimes that they did, we would say our judicial system is messed up and wrong, right? Same thing with God. If there is something you did wrong, there must be a punishment for that. So God being just, there, and being that being part of his character, there had to be judgment for the sin of Adam and Eve. So right after we see God's mercy shown to Adam and Eve, the next thing we find in the verse we're going to look at today is we find God's judgment. The consequences for their sin. And we start with the serpent. So what we're going to do for the next few weeks here if we're going to be focusing on each one of these, I wasn't going to go through all of them just in, in, in as a the whole, but I think it's important to focus on each one separately because uh, especially with Adam and Eve, um, we're going we're gonna to see that the effects or the curses or the judgment that we find in those are play a role, a big role in our life today. And I want to really flush out what those roles and how we can see them displayed and how we can even uh, work against uh, those, uh, what we see and how it's not supposed to be that way. So anyways, um, so, so this week we're going to look at the serpent and how the serpent's judgment and learn from the serpent's judgment and also just, just understand it in a deeper way, hopefully, this morning. So let's dive into the passage this morning, Genesis chapter 3. There's only two verses. I'm going to read the whole thing, and then I'll kind of unpack them um, for the rest of the service. Genesis chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock, and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So what we start, we have the serpent's judgment. Now it's interesting, the serpent's judgment is his serpent, this is unique in, in a way. Because at first glance, when you read verse 14 and 15, right, you're reading, you read verse, you read verse 14, which is, Curse are you above all the livestock and the beasts of the field. Why this is unique? Because when this judgment is read just plainly, if you don't understand who the serpent is or, or really the background of the serpent, it sounds like very 
this understanding that 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 God is judging the animal of the serpent, right? Like everything in here is very clearly kind of talking about an, an, an animal, right? It's a, it uh, curse you above all livestock. You're on the belly you shall go, um, and you should eat the day you left. Like very, we look at this it's just at, at a first glance, and it seems like a serpent is just an animal, and God's judging the animal. But we all know the serpent is actually Satan. Revelation 12 and, and, and 20, and uh, in, in chapter 20, it makes this very clear that, that an ancient serpent of old is Satan. But before John wrote this, even the Jews had a common understanding that the serpent was not just an animal, that the serpent was the evil, the serpent was Satan, it was the devil. Either Satan possessed this animal, or Satan took the form of a serpent, whatever, how he did this, we don't quite know. But most un his understanding is, and we all understand this, is a serpent is Satan. So I believe in this judgment, this is why this judgment is interesting and unique, is it's actually dual meaning inside this judgment. Where yes, God is, I do believe, he's judging the serpent as an animal, but there's another level to this judgment, you could say, that God is actually also extending the judgment to Satan as well. And I want to show us today how they actually amazingly link together. And there's a reason why God did this. So the first way I want to handle this, I want us to focus on each of them. First, I want to focus on the serpent, uh, the judgment of the animal, the serpent, and then look at the judgment of Satan. So first, look at the judgment of the animal being the serpent, or for us, you probably know it's a snake, right? There's three judgments that we find here, and I want to break these down. The first is this, we see it in verse 14, is that uh, the serpent, the snake, will be cursed above all the beasts. It's in verse 14, because you've done this, curse of you above all the livestock and all the beasts of the field. The first thing to notice here is it's actually amazing. You find a status change for the serpent. You look back at chapter 3, verse 1, what does it say about the serpent? It said that he was, he was more crafty than the other beasts of the field, right? So that about all the beasts that feel the serpent was at the beginning, he was the most crafty, or the other translation, translations use the word cunning. You understand, I made a note of this a few weeks ago when we went through this text. In the original Hebrew, the word crafty and cunning had no negative connotations. So, so when we read that, we think, okay, crafty means he's bad, right? No. It actually, instead, what I think what it means is, is the serpent was more intelligent. So when we're first introduced to the serpent, we understand this is a very intelligent, intelligible animal. Probably one of the most intelligent animals on the earth at that point. Possibly even, I made this note, maybe there's a possibility, he's able to even, maybe even communicate with humans. I don't know. It's very strange that Eve did not run away from the serpent when, she started, when the serpent started talking to, to her. So could it be that the serpent had some ability to, uh, he was more intelligent than all the other animals, that he actually could even communicate, could make a telephone thought and talk to us? Or maybe all the animals talk about it. I don't know. But either way, it's something very interesting that this serpent was, in the very beginning, very smart, very crafty, very cunning. And now you find the total opposite. Now the serpent is cursed out of all the animals. It's a complete contrast. And at, the, and at this moment, if the serpent could talk, or, if, or, or, or we, we could have intelligible thoughts, at this moment, I believe God stripped that ability from him. And then he goes on, the second judgment we find, is to explain, obviously, even explain further how the serpent will be cursed. The second judgment is that he will crawl in the dust. Crawl in the dust. It says in uh, verse 14, it says, On your belly you shall go, and the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And what's implied here, the serpent, or the snake as we know the serpent as, originally probably had legs and arms. Maybe he walked on all four. Some believe he actually, the serpent could walk and stood like a human and walk around like that. So what God is saying to the serpent is you no longer have legs or arms. You're no longer going to walk around like, a, like, a, like other animals. You're going to slither on the ground. On your belly you're going to live. On all the days of your life you're going to eat dust. You know, it's, and, it, and, it's, and it's why it's common belief that um, by most, all Christians and all theologians that the serpent is a snake. The snakes slither on the ground. They, or they, they, uh, they, they eat the dust all the days of their life. And I think about it, though. And, and this is why I believe this judgment has a, a, has a purpose and why God judged this way. So I, think it's, I think it's done to give us a clear picture of the status of, of, for serpents among all creation at this point. The serpent was, was the lowest out of all the other animals. They would even, so much so that they would even crawl on the ground. 
This is a degrading position. Like, the thing about it, like, we, we say things, like, all the time, like, and this is kind of a common phrase, like, you're dragging my name through the dirt, right? Or, or, or you're dragging that thing th through the mud. You're dragging my name through the mud. And we use this phrase because dragging something in the dirt or throwing something in the dirt is seen as something as a disgrace, right? It's something of, of value. You don't just throw in the mud. You keep it clean and, 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 and you value it, Right? To throw something in the dirt and the mud means you don't care about this thing. It's less than it's no good. So for God to say to the serpent, you're going to crawl in the dust. You're going to eat of it all the days of your life. This is now where you are going to live in the dust, on the dirt. It's going to say that, that you have lost all respect among creation. You were once the highest out of all creation. Now you're the lowest in all creation. You will be uh, looked down upon by most animals. You will be walked over. You will be stepped on. And even the third judgment, you will be crushed. And actually, I, I, I know the ESV translate uh, verse 15 as you shall bruise his head, uh, or he shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. Other translations use the word crush. I like crush way better. Just, it's way better imagery. Yeah. Like crush you, right? So so even like crushed. Like, so, so, so the third judgment is this. The humans, basically, uh, to look at the animal side of this, the humans will despise the serpent. Even if you, if you think about snakes right now, like I know, I know, I told you the story a few weeks ago that I don't mind snakes. You now the kid we used to catch them all the time. We used to throw them in buckets, and it was, it was kind of something me and my brother did. But they don't really scare me. But if, even if I do see a snake in the wild to today, I still flinch. Right, especially a big one, or especially even if like it, it, we don't have these in Maine, but especially if this snake was poisonous and it could actually kill you, right? I'm going to flinch. I'm going to run. Do something like that. Think about it. Like what? What do most people do when they see a snake? Especially if that snake, once again, was poisoned and poisonous, as this snake can kill you. It can bruise your, your heel. It could actually uh, hurt, hurt you. We're not talking about a gardener snake. We're talking about a snake that has fangs and is venomous. And if it bit you, you would die. Right? What are you going to do when you see that snake? You're going to scream. You're going to run. You're going to right. You're going to pick. You're going to kill it. Right? You're going to kick it. You're going to you're going to you're going to crush its head. Right? You're going to do something. You're going to get. You're going to get that snake out of your presence. If it, you never hear of a person seeing a poisonous snake and running up to it and trying to pet it, that doesn't make sense. And why? Because the text says there's going to be enmity, enmity, hostility towards us humans and the snake. The serpent will attack the heels of humans. Be like a mortal blow to us, attacking the our Achilles heel in a way, if you think, and it would kill us instantly. And so there'd be fear because they are, are deadly, and because they are feared among us as humans, we are going to see a serpent, we are going to kill the serpent. We're going to crush its head. We're going to take our boot, and the imagery, I love the imagery, it's like to take your, your heel of your, your shoe and just stand right the head. That's the imagery that's meant to be here. Now, the question I've always wondered here is, is it is going to lead us into the next judgment, is why did God curse the serpent as a species? Why did God do this? I mean, it wasn't the snake's fault or the serpent's fault that Satan chose that species to deceive Eve. And I told you this story a few, few, few weeks ago that a man in a church I grew up, the man, a man in the church I grew up in, uh, he thought snakes were demonic. He was adamant. They're demonic, and people should never own snakes. They should never even take pictures with the snakes. You know, like some of us take pictures. We put snakes around our, our uh, shoulders, and maybe so you have a picture somewhere like that. Like he, he literally took this to a to an extreme to say, because of this passage, when you see a snake, they ought to all die. Like you see it crush its head, they ought to be extinct from the earth. That was his view of what what, what we should do with snakes. And I don't think snakes are necessarily demonic. But I do think there's a reason why God decided to curse the entire serpent species, all snakes. Why he decided to for, for, for the serpent to no longer walk, to no longer have legs, and for, no, for the serpent to be seen as less than and, and, and one of the lowest positions in all of creation. And I think the reason why God decided to do this, it's going to lead us into the last one, the last, uh, second part of the judgment here, is for us to remember the fall. To remember the sin of Adam and Eve. This is not a foreign concept in Scripture for God to do this. Like all throughout Scripture, God commands us to do things to remember a certain event. 
or certain sin. Like you, I, I don't have time to go through all of them, but you read through Genesis especially, we're going to see this happening over and over again. They're, they're setting up altars, they're doing things to remember what God did, or remember a command that God gave, or remember something that God, uh, what happened in that time. Like this, give you just two examples, the Passover feast. Not to dive into the depths of this, but but that part of that festival, the main part of it, is to for Israelites to remember how God delivered them out of Egypt, right? But for us as Christians, why do we do communion? We do communion because Jesus said, do this, do this in remembrance of me, right? We take the bread, we take the bread and we break it. What does it represent? God's body broken for us, right? We take the juice or the, or the, or the wine, right? For the wine. <laughs> but when we do juice, right? So we take the juice and we drink it. Why? To remember Christ's blood shed for us. Remembrance. So why, why would it be foreign for us to think that God decided to curse this serpent, curse the snake, so that even today when we see a snake, and this is why it changed my whole concept of understanding, okay, when I see a snake now, whoa, that's meant for me to think about the idea that this snake is slipping on the ground, eating the dust on the earth, and every time you crush a serpent's head, we are to remember the judgment of God. We are to remember that, that Adam and Eve's sin got them in this place, or even the serpent's sin, and also, I would even go further here, we are meant to remind ourselves every time we see the serpent, and every time the serpent head is crushed, we are to remember that Satan's judgment is coming and has come already. So let's break down the second meaning of the, the judgment. It's going to all tie in. So I said, it's actually an amazing imagery here of, of why God decided to, to, to do two judgments here. It's for us to remember of who Satan is and what he did, and also remember that he will be defeated. So let's break down the second meaning of this judgment. It's the judgment of Satan, who is the ancient servant of old. First thing, they're going to tie into to each other. First thing we see, first judgment, is he is cursed above all created things. He's cursed above all created things. Just as the judgment for the serpent and the snakes, Satan is also cursed above all created things. Just to dive, I'm not going to dive into the depths of this, but, but just to kind of give a quick overview of Satan. We don't know much about Satan in Scripture. He's, he's only referred to, if he, well, he's referred to often, but his background and his history of where he came from and what happened in the fall of Satan, we don't get a lot of passages explaining this to us. But we do know from Scripture that Satan was an angelic being that became so full of pride that he desired to be like God, and the worship that was given to God, he desired that worship for himself. And because of that pride, God judged him and cast him out of heaven. And what many believe, when he was cast out of heaven, he ended up dwelling here on earth, where he would deceive God's perfect and unique creation, us as humans, he would deceive them into rebelling against God, the creator, to not worship their God anymore, but to worship God, something God created, and by doing so, God's unique creation, humans could no longer worship God without any barriers. The separation between God and man was now fractured because of Satan's deceit. So, so follow me. So Satan fell, he sinned, he disobeyed God, just as Adam and Eve did. Yet, this is why I believe Satan is cursed above all created things. Yet for Satan, his judgment is far more severe than ours. He is truly cursed above all created things. And why do I say that? Because... I, <clears throat> As far as you know, by reading scripture, there is no salvation for Satan. There's no mercy given to Satan. There's no grace given to Satan. I fully believe there's no way for Satan to actually repent of his sins. And if there was a way, I don't think he would. It actually tells us in 1 Peter 10, 12, that not just Satan, but all the angels actually look to understand. They look into uh, the, uh, the gospel. They look into what Jesus did for us to understand salvation. Because that wasn't given to them. His relationship between God and man is different between the relationship between, the relationship between God and angelic beings. God's relationship with us is different than it is with angelic beings. You need to understand that. I know sometimes we think become angels or, or we want to be like angels. No, we're separate. And it's a good thing. I fully believe that there is, there is no redemption for Satan as far as we know. And I, and I go even further, the reason why I believe this, Revelation 20, 10, when you, you actually read of Satan's destruction, we know, we know where Satan is going to end up. There is no redemption for him. There is no salvation for him. There is no repentance for him. Because he will be thrown into the lake of fire, which is hell. He will be destroyed. He will. Satan is truly cursed above all created things. There's no way for him to be forgiven. He is cursed. But he's also hated. 
He desires, interesting, he desired honor and praise, but instead God stripped him any of that respect. So say in second uh, curse, the Satan was stripped of quite any honor that he, he would have. Just as a serpent would now slither on the ground, eating the dust of the earth, which is clearly, which is why, which is why I wanted to flush this out, because it's clearly a humiliating position to be in. It's degrading, lower than others. Everyone's looking down on you. So Satan also was cast down out of heaven. Jesus actually makes a reference of this. Luke uh, 10, 18, Jesus says, that I saw Satan like fall from lightning, like lightning from heaven. Jesus saw this happen. Jesus saw the judgment of Satan. He fell, and the judgment was fast. The lightning was meant to be like it. When Satan sinned against God, it was immediate judgment. No mercy. Falling down from heaven. Falling to your cast out. You did wrong. Done. He stripped of his position. He stripped of any honor and any respect that he had to be now lower than all angelic beings. And then even hated among those that he now dwells with, which is us. Like, think about this. Satan's name is synonymous with evil and wickedness. For most of the world, and I know this is, I'm going to get this in a moment quickly, but for most of the world, Satan is not thought of as a friendly person. A person you want to be like, a person that you want to emulate. He, his name is not honored or praised among most people. I mean, he, even the greatest scheme that Satan has the greatest way that he deceives us is to make us believe he doesn't even exist. Think about that. That's not an honoring position. Like he tells the scripture that he lurks in the shadows, looking for someone to devour, to devour the weak, to devour the vulnerable. This guy's a coward. Like this, this is who he is. I know we, we think of it as some mighty, he's not mighty. Stop putting him in these higher positions that he ought to be. He is just he is he is not to be honored. He is not to be respected. He is lower than all creation. And we ought to see him this way. For for most of the people in the world, even even today, I know this is starting to switch and scary to watch things happen where people are starting to even honor Satan in a way. It's it's, it's disgusting. But even for most people in the world, if you would say, I follow Satan, or, or I worship Satan, you said, people would you think it's ridiculous and you would frown, frown upon you. Even the idea, we've all heard before, like, like um, people say, I, I sold my soul to the devil. That's never a good thing. Regardless of who you are, a Christian or not, the, the, the common thought, Satan is evil, and he's bad, he's not to be respected or honored at all. And what's very concerning and frightening is that we're actually seeing some of this change in our world today. This is why it's, it's, it's very interesting watching, especially in, in the music. And, and I mean, people, I mean, you, you watch it, on, and I don't want to dive into it too much, but we've all seen the videos of the, of the uh, probably on Facebook or something, of, of, a, of, a, of an artist, especially music, dressing up like Satan, people wearing upside down crosses, people literally actually making claims of worshiping Lucifer. Which is concerning and scary, but in a way, it actually it just a, it's, it's interesting that it's the music that we see the most. It's actually a common thought among many theologians of Lucifer, who many believe is his name actually was his, was his angelic name, was actually a worship leader in, in heaven. He led the angels in worship to God. It's ironic, isn't it? But the first place we see it, the, mo the place we see it the most, I would say, is in the music that we listen to. The artists that are dressing up and, and acting in a way that is utterly ridiculous. But even, but even so in this, in general, most people, when you think about Satan, especially for us as Christians, we ought to never respect him. Never give him honor. He's a person that is cursed above all created things. He also is a person that is stripped of any honor by God. And, and the last judgment of the curse is the most amazing one. And this is for sure my most favorite and one of my most favorite passages in all scripture. The third judgment is that the woman's offspring will crush Satan's head. A woman's offspring will crush Satan's head. Now, some of you know where I'm going with this, and, and some of you just know this passage, and, and I'm going to say this, if you know where I'm going with this, this ought to never get old for you. This is the most amazing passage in all of, one of the most amazing passages in all of Scripture. All right, look, so let's read verse 15. It says, I will put enmity, enmity between you and the woman, 
between your offspring and her offspring, and he shall bruise or crush your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Verse 15 is a very strange passage when compared to the rest of the Bible and really ancient, uh, how, um, uh, how writing was um, in ancient literature it is written. And why is it very unique and different? Because it's the only place found in Scripture where a person is referred to as a woman's offspring, a woman's descendant. Every other place in Scripture where you find an offspring is always a man's offspring, a man's descendant. In a few weeks, we're going to go through the infamous genealogies that people just got skimmed through, right? But when you read those genealogies, what are you going to notice? It's always the man and the son. If, if ever is a woman mentioned, or ever is a mother mentioned, or a daughter mentioned, it's next to, next to a son or next to her husband. This is the way they wrote, wrote things. To make, to make it even more clear, right? The King James Version actually translates uh, offspring to seed. Not to get into birds and bees here, but guys, guys women don't produce seeds, okay? Just point something, right? So it's very clear what we're talking about here. This is a very strange passage. So what does this mean? There is hostility between Satan and her future descendant of a woman not a man. A descendant that will be born without any man involved in the conception of this child. A child that is born without a biological father. We're talking about a virgin birth here. And there, there, this hostility between this woman's son and Satan will lead to a fight, will lead to a battle, where Satan will inflict a mortal wound on this man. But this man, this offspring of a woman, will not stay in the grave. He will not remain dead. But he will rise up to crush the head of Satan, ending him once and for all. Now think of track when you know who this person is. So who is this man? For a thousand years, Jews did, not, Jews did not know the answer. They knew there was one to come, a woman's offspring. It probably confused them a little bit. It's because there never was a man that would be born without a biological father. That's impossible, right? There never was a baby born from a virgin. That is just ridiculous. That doesn't happen until Jesus and isn't it amazing? I, I've always been in awe of this passage right here because right after Adam and Eve sinned, right after they deliberately chose to disobey God and rebel against him, they, they, when they deserve to die, but God shows them mercy, and right after this, you start to see God's plan for them to come back to relationship with him. And it, it, it even comes before you read of the judgment of Adam and Eve. We first read of the judgment of, of Satan. That's the first thing we read. We next we'll get to the judgment of the woman and the man. Before we even get to that judgment yet, that curse that Adam and Eve are going to have to live with, and we're going to live with the rest of our lives, we read of how God plans for humans, for a way for humans to be justified, for humans to be made right before God, for our sins to be forgiven. That for our judgment and our consequences of what for what we did can be wiped away for us to be, so we can be made holy and perfect free of shame and guilt. And it's not by us working hard or by us earning our way back to God, but instead God is saying right here in Genesis three fifteen, I am going to send to you a savior, one that will be born who will not be a son of Adam, but one that will be a new Adam. A second Adam that would never sin, that would resist Satan in all his lies, and that he would also crush Satan's head. And how did Jesus crush the serpent's head? Let's just, play, let's just lay this out plainly. By the most unlikely of ways, by dying, <laughs> by letting evil win, by letting the pawns of Satan kill him. This is Satan biting his heel, bruising his heel. And it will look like in that moment that hell won. It looks like in that moment that Satan had won the battle. But three days later, Jesus rose from the dead, conquering sin and, and death, and ending Satan's rule and reign over our lives. Amen. Jesus set the captives free by giving us a new life. It's, it's amazing. My, my, my kids, they actually have this uh, children's book. And what they, what they, the title they give Jesus is State Crusher. I love it. <laughs> right? Such a cool imagery. Jesus is the snake crusher. And this is the gospel, right? You understand? This is the gospel. Right here, first few pages of the Bible, you find out God's plan to redeem us and to save us. It's amazing. But before we close, there's one more thing I want to say that, that needs to be said about verse 13 because it's one more thing that I think is here that we might just gloss over and not quite understand here. Because there's enmity 
as it said, between the woman's offspring and Satan. In other words, Satan hates the woman's offspring. He despises Jesus. He hates anything that has to do with Jesus. Because the final blow to Satan's head, I would say Satan's head is, is wounded and, and crushed parts of it, but there is one day where his head will literally be demolished. You can think of it like that, okay? It will be struck. It will be finally gone. Satan hates it because the final blow is to come. <clears throat> Jesus right now, the scripture is telling us, it's, it's very clear on this, that he's conquering all of Satan's dominion here on earth through the Holy Spirit working through us as Christians, the kingdom growing, and he's putting, as he's doing this, he's putting all enemies underneath his feet. And he's reigning as king now, he's making all of the demonic realm his footstool. And why is he making his footstool? Because he's going to crush it. So what does this mean? Revelation 12, 12 tells us the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows his time is short. Understand that Satan knows his time is short and his wrath is and his anger will only become greater and greater and greater as God's kingdom, as Jesus' kingdom grows here on earth. Which means, as Christians, as people that have been called out of darkness, people that have been adopted by God to be his children, to be his image bearers, to be his light, to be imitators of him, what this means is, he absolutely hates you. And his wrath against you will only become greater and greater and greater when his kingdom grows. Listen to this. Jesus, just as a snake, I want you to think about this. Just as a snake is a reminder for us as Satan's demise and destruction. Next time you see a snake, just think to yourself, like, like think of Satan's head being crushed and that snake, like just imagine that picture. But just as the snake is a reminder for us of Satan's demise and his head being crushed, as Christians, we are a reminder to Satan of his demise and his destruction. We are a reminder to him that his head will soon be crushed and he will be thrown into a lake of fire. But as Christians, don't let this stop you. Instead, let's fuel you. Let's encourage you. As the, as the apostles said, after they, got, after they got persecuted, they rejoiced in their suffering because they were worthy to be counted, to, uh, to be worthy to be persecuted in the name of Christ. Let that be us. Rejoice because as he's persecuting you and as he's attacking you and as you, his wrath, his anger is being burned even hotter against you, be encouraged and rejoice the fact that you know that you are his. As Isaiah 54, 17 says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Nothing he will do can end you, can hurt you. It might hurt for a moment, but you know you're going. And you know that this one thing I'll end with is one thing we have to know is why he can never be honored, never be praised. And honestly, I would even say, not fear. We don't need to fear Satan. God did not give us a spirit of fear, right? First Timothy says, we don't have a spirit of fear. Satan is a defeated enemy. He knows he's defeated. And his days are numbered. So live in that way. Don't fear the world. Don't fear the persecution. Don't, when you look at the culture, you see the way the culture is going, don't fear it. We know who wins. We know who wins. We know it. And when you see that happening, just understand his anger is getting hotter. Like he's getting his, his wrath is he's being kindled even more. He's trying more and more to try to dissuade this culture towards, towards him. But know that it will never, ever work. And Christ will reign as king forever. Not Satan. He will be destroyed. And we need to know that for certain. Let's bow our heads. Lord God. We love you, Lord. We thank you that, um, first, we thank you, Lord, that you, you actually you did crush the head of the serpent for the first time on the cross. You broke the chains that, 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 that held us to our sin. You broke the chains that, that were literally leading us to hell. You tore the veil, Lord, that was between us and you on, on the cross, God. The first battle has been won. We thank you that you did that for us so we can be saved and we can, we can have a relationship with you. We also look forward to the day, I pray for this over all of us, God, in this room, that we will look forward to the day where you will one, where Satan will one day be forever gone, where his head will be crushed and he will be no more. We thank you most importantly, Lord, that you did this for us. We don't deserve this. We didn't, we didn't do anything to earn this, God. 
But right in Genesis 3, for, for 15, right after we sin, right after Adam and Eve did this against you, and they deserve to die, they deserve to, to be ended right then, and there you told them they will show to die. You show them mercy, you show them love, and you show them grace by sending, by saying, I'm going to send somebody to give you what you don't deserve. I'm going to crush the serpent's head. I'm going to end this for all. And, and one day you will be free of all of this. And one day you will be with me. And one day we will return back to the way that God created, the way, the way you created us, Lord. Thank you that we have that promise right in the beginning of Scripture. Now, when I pray for us, the congregation, we will live in that promise. We won't, we won't let the, the world sway us. We won't look at everything and, and live in doomsday mode and think, oh, it's it. Like, like you would live in a way you glory. We live in a way that, that, that shows uh, uh, it shows that shows our confidence in you to know what the end is going to be. And we're not living in, in fear, but we're living in confidence in the confidence that's found in you. Lord, I pray for anybody in this room that doesn't know you, or any somebody watching online, God, right now, that does not know you, does not have a relationship with you, that doesn't have this confidence for the future, or even the hope for the future, most importantly. Pray that right now, they would surrender to you. They would surrender to the true king. And God, you would break the chains that are holding them back from you right now, Lord. We thank you. We love you. Turn in your pray in Jesus' name. Okay. We're gonna sing one more song. Please stay in. It's a song of victory. Over everything we just talked about. I just love when uh, sometimes accidentally the last song coincides with um, what we've we've heard. Um, there's, a, there's a verse in here that says, "Every fear has no place at the sound of your great name." The enemy, he has to leave at the sound of your great name. Why fear? Satan already knows he's crushed. Amen.
Have a great week, everybody. God bless. We'll see you all next week.